I, I do have a few things to get through. So just uh, give me a few minutes here. Uh, as the secretary said on Saturday, uh, we are all incredibly saddened to hear uh, of the tragic loss of the 53 Indonesian sailors uh, on board their submarine. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those sailors and everyone in the Indonesian military as they cope with this tra tragedy. Now, shifting to India, the United States uh, deeply values our partnership, and we are determined to help the people of India as they bravely com combat this uh, outbreak. So to that end, I think you saw over the weekend uh, in the Secretary's statement, the Department is working closely with other U.S. agencies to rapidly deploy oxygen-related equipment, rapid testing kits, personal protective equipment, and other essential materials to our Indian partners. We are also in close communication with the government of India to ensure that we are providing India's frontline health care workers with any support we can offer within our authority. In the days and weeks ahead, we will continue to coordinate with our allies and like-minded countries to ensure that our collective efforts are closely synchronized and poised to have the maximal impact in mitigating this crisis. Uh, the Department is also looking to begin making delivery of supplies within the next few days. We'll also provide transportation and logistics assistance to deliver these needed supplies as quickly as possible. Uh, on to schedule, the Secretary will conduct several visits to combatant commands this week. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to meet with senior military leaders uh, and to better understand the, the important capabilities that they bring to the mission of defending this nation and, of course, the challenges that they're facing. So tomorrow, uh, the Secretary will visit U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency. And then beginning on Thursday, uh, he will travel to U.S. Space Command and then onward to U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, uh, and then uh, uh, on the way uh, home from U.S. Indo-Pacific Command to uh, U.S. Strategic Command to discuss deterrence, the Department's space strategy, and the Department's integrated approach toward preserving the nation's strategic advantage during this era of great power competition. Uh, also on Friday, while at Indo-Pacific Command, he will preside over the change of command ceremony uh, there between Admiral Davidson and Admiral Aquilino. Also of note, today is the last day of Unmanned Integrated Battle Problem 21 off the coast of California. We talked about this a week or so ago when the exercise started. Uh, in this exercise, unmanned surface vessels Seahawk and Sea Hunter demonstrated the ability to find and locate opposition forces. And the MQ-9 Sea Guardian integrated with manned naval air and surface and subsurface assets in, an in, a, in, a, in a successful anti-submarine warfare exercise. Boy, that was hard to get out. Uh, operational vignettes like this from U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, enable us to further incorporate unmanned capabilities into our day-to-day -day fleet operations and battle plans. Now, as you are also well aware, the President announced on Friday his intent to nominate the following individuals to serve in key national security positions here in the Department. Sean Skelly for Assistant Secretary of Defense for Readiness, Deborah Rosenblum as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear, Chemical, and Biological Defense Programs, Christopher Mayer as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict, and Sue Fulton as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Manpower and Reserve Affairs. These deeply qualified public servants represent decades of combined ex expertise in national security. The Secretary is grateful for their willingness to serve the country, uh, and he urges the Senate to confirm them soon. Speaking of personnel, today we onboarded Samuel Brannon as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Plans and Posture. This would now bring our total uh, number of appointees uh, up to 100, uh, 105. Finally, following a thorough safety review, as I think you've seen, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration have determined that the recommended pause regarding the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine in the United States should be lifted and use of the vaccine should resume. So DOD sites will now begin a controlled resumption of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine later this week. DOD will ensure all recipients of the vaccine are aware of all known side effects and potential risks before they receive it. The department currently has approximately 100,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that are located primarily in Indopaycom, European Command, Central Command, Southern Command, and Africa Command areas of responsibility. With that, we'll start taking questions, and I think I've got Bob on the phone. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, I have a question for you about Afghanistan. 
Last week, uh, General McKenzie mentioned that the U.S. will continue to support Afghan forces after the withdrawal is completed. He gave an example of conducting aircraft maintenance remotely, um, in other words, from another country. And my question is um, whether Secretary Austin has has asked for or has received um, a plan or a concept of operations for how far you can go with this kind of remote continuation of the mission of advising and assisting and supporting Afghan forces when you're not actually there. Thank you. Yeah, Bob, actually, he and General McKenzie have talked about this exact uh, idea. Uh, as you heard the secretary say in Brussels, we, we will continue a measure of financial support. Uh, it, and one, one of the things that we want to look at is their, uh, their con contractual needs uh, and the degree to which they are still going to require, particularly aviation maintenance support. And I think that's primarily what uh, General McKenzie was referring to. So, yes, they have been in touch. Uh, he is expecting General McKenzie to come back uh, before uh, the end of the month, uh, by the end of the week, with a, uh, uh, a adjusted, revised um, a drawdown plan uh, and also looks for the general's recommendations, as well as those of, uh, of General Milley, too, uh, their recommendations about uh, contractual support going forward. So we don't have all the answers right now, Bob, but, but yes, there, there is a, there's a lot of thinking being done about how that contractual support will look like going forward. One quick follow-up. Would this include operational support? In other words, to help them, for example, to conduct airstrikes with information, intelligence, or any kind of technical advice? No, Bob, that's not the, that's not the nature of support to uh, Afghan security forces. Uh, uh, as I think you uh, heard uh, General Miller say over the weekend when he spoke to reporters that uh, the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces must be ready to assume the responsibility to defend their citizens and their country. Our support uh, to the Afghan, Afghan forces will be primarily financially based. And certainly, again, we're looking at um, how we can uh, continue to su su support uh, in a responsible way some of their con contractual requirements uh, for things like aviation maintenance. Thank you. Yep. Megan. Can you confirm reporting from earlier today that about 650 uh, special operators are heading to Afghanistan to do security? for the drawdown, and are there any plans to send, or what are the plans to send um, logistics troops as well to help everybody break things down and move it out? I'm not at liberty to confirm those press reports uh, uh, that had a very specific number and a very specific type of uh, force protection assets. Um, I think you can understand we want to be uh, careful about um, uh, some elements of, of our ability to provide for force protection, but, Megan, um, uh, as we've said almost from the get-go, uh, I think you can expect that there will be an addition uh, of, uh, of, of uh, posture in, in Afghanistan to assist with this drawdown to make sure that it is safe and orderly, um, uh, but again, without confirming the specifics. And then this, in, in keeping with that same idea, to make sure that the drawdown is safe and orderly, um, as we have said, uh, it is perfectly logical that uh, we may see additional logistics personnel and engineering support, again, to help with the, the physical movement of assets and people out of Afghanistan. I don't have any uh, announcements to make today or sp specific orders to speak to, uh, but that is certainly uh, one of the things that we're looking at, and it, it should come as no surprise to anybody that we would, would probably have to provide some enabling capabilities into Afghanistan to allow this to, to occur, very similar to how we've done uh, similar operations in the past. But you're not not sending security protection. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's a weird way of putting it. Um, I mean, we talked about Friday, the extension of uh, the aircraft carrier Eisenhower in the region and the addition of, of, uh, of some uh, B-52 assets, uh, which now number four uh, in the region, uh, to help provide force protection. So, no, we are not not sending, uh, a, a, you know, force protection assets. I just won't th — there, there will be some force protection assets that we'll be able to talk about, uh, and then there'll be some that we probably aren't going to want to detail in any uh, great specificity. Again, 
for purposes of force protection and operational security. We have to assume, though we don't want it to be this way, that this drawdown could be opposed by the Taliban. And again, we, we want to make sure that, uh, first and foremost, that doesn't happen. And secondly, if it does, that we've got enough capability to make sure that we can protect our people as they move out of the country. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jeff Selden, VOA. Thanks. Uh, sorry about the delay and getting off mute. That's I okay. was wondering if you had any update on the Russian troops along the border with Ukraine. Uh, you expressed some hope uh, last week that uh, they, they would be moving back, but you said it was too early to see. Have, have you seen anything over the weekend that, that gives you any confidence, perhaps, that Russia is sticking to what it said it would do and, and pull those troops back? Well, without getting into great specificity, um, because you know we're loath to speak about intelligence assessments here, uh, we have seen um, some uh, departure of some uh, forces uh, away from uh, away from Ukraine, Russian forces away from Ukraine. But it's as I said Friday, and I and I think we would still maintain this that it's it's too soon to tell uh, and to take at face value. Uh, Russian claims that what they said was an exercise is now over and they're and they're pulling everybody back. So we're going to keep watching this very, very closely. Inside the room. Ma'am. Hi. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned four B-52s. Is that in, the, in addition to the two? Sorry. Total so of four? Two came. There were two. Thank you. There's another two. That have come since Friday. That's correct. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Okay, Jenny, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, on the missile defense system, uh, the, how is the thought a defense missile uh, deployed in South Korea managed? Is the, is the defense, I mean, missile defense system of the South Korea and the United States is operating well, or what? How is the uh, situation in? I, I don't have any. I don't have any specific missile defense capabilities to speak to, uh, Janie, and I think you can understand why uh, we'd want to be careful about that. Um, uh, obviously, we take our commitments very seriously uh, there on the peninsula, and uh, uh, South Korea is a, a treaty ally, um, and uh, and we're committed to the defense of, of South Korea uh, in any number of ways and across a range of capabilities. But I don't have anything specific on missile defense to speak to today. You know, as you know that the South Korea Moon Jae-in government has agreed with China not to enter the missile defense system with the United States. Are there any uh, plan to deploy additional thought into South Korea? I don't have any uh, additional capabilities to speak to today. No. All right. Can you take a question? No, no. Why not? I, I, I don't have anything additionally to say about this today, and um, and you know we're it's not the kind of thing that we would uh, that we would speak to uh, again hypothetically unless or until there was an agreement between the two governments, and I just don't I I, um, I don't know that taking the question would be very helpful for you today. All right, thank you. You're welcome, Abraham. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, Last week, some legislation was, uh, a bill was introduced that would help burn pit victims by um, adding a sort of a, pre a presumption of exposure. I wondered if- uh, Burn pit victims. Uh, burn pit victims, yeah. right. Um, uh, so I wondered if Secretary Austin has worked with uh, the VA secretary on making any progress of studies or designations that would that would help some of those veterans who are still suffering to get the right type of uh, treatment and, uh, and testing. And also separately, um, you mentioned that Secretary is going to stop at Indo-PACOM coming up. Um, do you have any update for us on the China Task Force? And this would be his second visit to Indo-PACOM. What what more would he be trying to achieve there? Thank you. So look on the burn pit. Uh issue. I don't have any specific programs or reviews to speak to today. Uh, it is something that he has discussed with Secretary McDonough. Both leaders uh, take this very, very seriously uh, and want to do whatever we can uh, to make sure that those veterans who um, have been and are and 
sadly will be affected by exposure uh, to burn pit uh, residue and, uh, and fumes uh, and chemicals uh, are properly treated um, and looked after. Uh, we, that's a sacred obligation that he shares with uh, Secretary McDonough, but I don't have anything specific to speak to uh, about that today. Um, on Indo-PACOM, the primary reason that uh, he's visiting Indo-PACOM this week is for the change of command. Um, it is uh, not at all uncommon for the Secretary of Defense to uh, attend and preside over the, the change of command of combatant commanders. Um, and that's what's driving the timing of this particular uh, visit. Now, while there, he is certainly going to uh, continue to talk to both uh, Admiral Davidson, who he's already met with and been briefed by, but also the incoming Indo-PACOM commander. He'll have some private time with Admiral Aquilino as well uh, to get his perspectives on the region and how he uh, views the job ahead of him. Um, because that region is so important to our national security interests, and, and he certainly has prioritized that part of the world. So this is another opportunity for him to um, continue to gain perspectives from military leaders, but also to, you know, convey some of his views going forward as well. Has he received any briefings from that China task force? Oh, I'm sorry, you did that? ask about the China task force. Um, he's been kept apprised of, uh, of the China task force, uh, their, their work. I think I mentioned it the other day um, when the senior leaders conference was going on Friday uh, that uh, Dr. Ratner had a chance to provide uh, some initial uh, thoughts uh, by the China Task Force to all the military leaders that were in attendance, uh, which included the, all the service chiefs, service secretaries, and, of course, uh, the combatant command commanders. So nothing specific you could share with us? No. The work is ongoing um, and uh, should wrap up probably in, in June, and I'm not going to get ahead of uh, the work that they're doing or what findings they might might have. It's important to remember that this effort is really about helping align the department to um, to better address and better deal uh, with the security challenges that are posed by uh, the PRC. Uh, and uh, they're going to be taking a holistic view of that within the department. It is a departmental task force uh, to be able to provide the secretary their best advice and counsel about uh, programs, policies, capabilities, operational concepts. Uh, that perhaps we need to improve upon uh, to continue to deal with the pacing challenge that, that the PRC represents. One, one more just quick follow-up on the burn pit thing. Is there anything the Secretary has the power to do now that can help uh, veterans? Abraham, that's a hypothetical that I, I'm just not equipped to deal with today. Uh, 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 so I, I, I can't answer that question for you today. Um, I, I'll take the question, but, but Abraham, uh, you know, it... Uh, I'll take the question. All I can tell you is that they're, they're, they're both in agreement that this is a serious issue. They both want to make sure uh, that our veterans get the care that they need. So whether it's, and not just veterans, if there's active duty members that are, are suffering from the after effects, I mean, they're lashed up on the need to make sure they take this seriously. But I don't have anything, I don't have any announcements to make today. I don't have any uh, specific policies or, or medical programs to, to speak to today. Um, but just rest assured that it's an issue they're both taken very seriously. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, Laura from Politico. Hey, John. Thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to ask you about Turkey. Um, I'm wondering whether the announcement um, about the Armenian genocide I think over the weekend has impacted our military relationship with Turkey or our defense relationship. No, we don't anticipate any uh, change in the military relationship with Turkey. Turkey's a NATO ally and an important one at that. Um, and uh, we continue to have across multiple domains and, and multiple issues opportunities to um, to continue to work at that relationship and improve that relationship. And we don't anticipate. Uh, th this announcement by the president over the weekend to affect it in any way at all. There was some re reporting earlier today about Turkey saying it was going to get out of uh, one of your key defense pacts. So I'm wondering about that specifically, and then also whether anything is going to change in Syria. I haven't uh, seen the reporting of them saying they want to get out of a defense pact, so you'd have to give me some more information so I could uh, run that down for you. I'm not tracking... Um, 
towards any kind of announcement by them in that regard. Um, and uh, I don't, again, anticipate a, a change um, in what we're doing in Syria uh, uh, as a result of this uh, announcement by, by the president. I think it's important to remember that uh, that our goal in Syria, our mission in Syria, though small in, in footprint, is still uh, uh, centered around the fight against ISIS and working with Syrian democratic forces uh, on the ground there uh, to continue to prosecute the war against ISIS. And uh, uh, I see no change to that mission as a result of this weekend's announcement. Sylvie. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask a question about Somalia. Um, the government forces have lost uh, control of part of the capital, Mogadishu, today. Um, so I wanted to know if uh, uh, first you intend to give uh, the government some military uh, aid. And second, what does it say about uh, the uh, uh, strategy to fight against uh, um, the enemy of the government uh, from uh, outside the country? I mean, some of those questions are better put to the State Department, Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, sorry. Um, uh, our, our focus in Somalia continues to be uh, uh, working against the violent extremist organizations that re remain a threat to Somalia and the region, particularly Al Shabaab, uh, and that means, you know, being willing to continue to partner with uh, local forces as they develop their defensive capabilities uh, and, uh, and to try to create the proper opportunities to continue to prosecute against this threat. That's our focus on there. I'm not aware of any, any military role here in the political circumstances that are going on in Somalia right now. And again, I'd refer you to the State Department for more on that. Mm. But in, in, in Mogadishu, it's not the political circumstances, it's forces. It's forces from uh, the opposing uh, uh, arm you know, it's, it's not... Uh, I, uh, all I can speak to is our mission in so Somalia, which is to partner with local forces against groups like al-Shabaab. I know of no U.S. military role in the developments that you're speaking to today. Okay. Um, can you offer any more details on why the U.S. military entrusted um, this group, Global Research Systems, with um, management of um, 175 million IP addresses, DOD IP addresses? What I can tell you, uh, Nancy, is that uh, uh, the Defense Digital Service authorized a pilot uh, effort uh, advertising uh, DOD internet protocol space using the border gateway protocol. The, the pilot is designed to assess, evaluate, and prevent unauthorized use of DOD IP address space. Um, the pilot may also help us identify potential vulnerabilities uh, uh, in that space. Uh, this is just one of many efforts uh, that we're focused on continually to improve our cyber posture and defense in response to uh, advanced persistent threats. Uh, we're, we're partnering uh, throughout uh, the, the DOD to ensure that potential vulnerabilities are, are mitigated. I'm not at liberty to go beyond that. Can I ask you this then? One if you, if this is um, about defense, it, it seems to me, given the amount of real estate, internet real estate that we're talking about, that this warranted some sort of public announcement beforehand, even without the details of it. If you were to move a carrier strike group or a division of, of soldiers, you would expect some sort of public acknowledgement of it, given the scope and scale of this. Why was it never discussed, even broadly, in any kind of public way? I really am not going to go into any greater detail than I've been able to go uh, so far, Nancy. I appreciate your question, but uh, I mean, I, I, I think I've spoken on this as much as I'm able to today. This is about protecting vulnerabilities uh, in cyberspace. Can I ask then, given the size and scope and the number of IP addresses that were used, um, if you would take the question in terms of why so many IP addresses, what precisely they were targeting, or any more additional information, because I think um, a lot of people have questions about it, the way it came out, and I think it would be only fair, I think, for DOD to provide some detail um, from somebody in that office about what it was hoping to achieve, whether it's done it before, what the success rate was, any sort of details on it. I'm, I'm just afraid we're not going to be able to provide more detail on this right now. 
um, I, I will take the question, but um, uh, I just think we've, we've spoken to the, the issue uh, as, as much as we're going to right now. And I, um, again, it is, as I said, it's about um, making sure that we're able to prevent unauthorized use of the space um, and to continue to improve our cyber posture. It's the responsible thing to do. And can you provide any detail on who the point of contact was between Global I cannot. Systems and the I cannot. I cannot. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joe Tabit. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, I'm wondering if you have anything to share with us about the Israeli military delegation who's visiting Washington, D.C. I guess it's uh, supposed to meet with Secretary Austin. No, there's no meeting. Uh, today uh, or this week between the secretary and uh, an Israeli delegation. As I understand it, some uh, some staff members from the Israeli Defense Force are, are here to meet uh, with their counterparts uh, in the building, but it won't include Secretary Austin. Uh, just uh, to follow up on the same topic, uh, what's the Pentagon's concerns in regards to the ongoing tensions between Israel and Iran? I mean, does the DOD fear any miscalculation that can lead to a, a confrontation? I mean, just, re, re, you know, without getting to specifics here, and I'm not going to speak for uh, other militaries uh, and what they are or they are not en engaged in. I mean, obviously, we um, uh, have uh, a vested interest in making sure that our national security interests in the region are secured and protected and defended, uh, and that includes uh, the, the, the kinds of threats uh, that Iran continues uh, to, to demonstrate in, in the region, uh, whether that's in the maritime environment or support for terrorist networks, uh, or, of course, they're uh, continually uh, advancing ballistic missile program. And that's what we're focused on. That's what the Secretary's focused on, uh, is making sure that we can protect our national security interests in the region. I won't speak for other militaries or, again, uh, operations that they're conducting, one way or the other. Okay. In the room. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask you about Taiwan. Uh, this month, the U.S. President Biden and the Japanese uh, Prime Minister agreed to work together to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, is the Pentagon going to encourage other allies and partners in the region, such as Australia or the Philippines, to join this U.S.-Japan-led effort to maintain peace and stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait? Uh, what we're after here is no unilateral change to the status quo. Uh, uh, nothing's changed about our one China policy informed by the, uh, the, the three communiques, the six assurances, and, of course, the Taiwan Relations Act. Nobody wants to see uh, that status quo change unilaterally. Certainly nobody wants to see this come to conflict. Um, uh, what, we're, what, what we're trying to do, and I think what the Secretary uh, certainly was focused on when we went to the region uh, a month or so ago was to uh, explore uh, new ways in which uh, we can improve our bilateral uh, security relationship w with Japan and with South Korea, but also to explore trilateral opportunities between us, Japan, and South Korea uh, along, uh, around, along a range of capabilities um, and, and a range of issues. Uh, and I think he came away from that trip feeling optimistic that there were opportunities to do that, that, the, um, that both Japan and South Korea were willing to continue to explore that, uh, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, let's see. Alex Ward from Vox. Hey, John. Happy Monday. Uh, excuse the, the little wind-up here. So the U.S., uh, through an FMS process, provides maintenance to the Saudis, uh, and that's leading at least the the Pentagon's argument are saying, we do not provide any support for offensive operations. That's the policy. Uh, but of course, there are critics who are saying, well, even if it's through an FMS process and it's indirect, that is still the US providing offensive support. Can you explain why it shouldn't be considered uh, offensive support to provide maintenance for Saudi aircraft? The su support that we provide to Saudi Arabia is designed to uh, support their self-defense. Uh, and this is a country that's under attack almost every day. 
Uh, and so what we've, what the president has decided is that we're, you know, the, the support we're giving them uh, will be primarily for uh, their self-defense and not um, to further permit or, or, uh, uh, or participate in uh, the Saudi-led coalition's offensive operations inside uh, Yemen. I, I understand where the question's going, uh, that, you know, maintenance support for systems, systems that uh, could be used for both purposes. I, I understand that. Um, I'm not going to get into a bunch of hypotheticals or, uh, you know, what abouts on this. Uh, the president's been clear. You know, we, we have a military-to-military -military -military relationship with Saudi Arabia that is important to the region and to our interests. Um, and we have a commitment to help them defend themselves against what are real threats. And that's what the, that's what the, the focus is on. Okay, in the room, Orrin. Uh, any DOD personnel joining, uh, going to India to help out with the equipment there? Any consideration of sending personnel with the equipment? We're still working our way through the kind of support that we're going to give to India, Oren. Right now, uh, it's not a discussion about uh, people so much as it is about material, whether it's uh, PPE, uh, oxygen uh, generators, uh, and other equipment that can help their frontline workers uh, continue to address uh, this impact. But that's, that's where the focus is right now. Mike. Yeah, hi, John. Can you uh, just just confirm the latest status of the recommendations from the Pentagon Review Committee or the Review Commission and whether would you say what that the Secretary is giving them giving these recommendations like a serious consideration or what's the status of You're talking about the Independent Review Commission right. and the initial set of recommendations right. uh, on the accountability line of effort. Right. Uh, he he just received them last week uh, and uh, he's looking them over He's grateful f for uh, the great effort that they put into creating these. I would stress that these are only initial recommendations in that one line of effort. And as I said last week, there could be additional inside the accountability line of effort. But he's only just received them. He's studying them and reviewing them. He's also asked that the services uh, take some time, uh, about a month, uh, to, to take a look uh, and offer him their candid views and feedback about those recommendations as well. Okay. okay. Also, can you follow up? Can you confirm these reports that the head of the Army CID has been fired? Uh, I can assure you that she has not uh, been fired. Uh, uh, General Martin um, uh, is still in her uh, in, in the job. Uh, I don't have any personnel announcements to make at this time, uh, but I can certainly put the rest the the rumors I've seen today that uh, that that she's you know, being terminated in the job, that is not true. Well, whether or not she's being transferred, she's only been in the job for about a year, which is a little, or, which is a little, would be a little short no, I, for any of your commanders. I understand that. I mean, again, there's no personnel announcements to make at this time. Um, uh, so I don't want to get ahead of the Army on this, and I'd certainly direct you to the Army for more information. Uh, but I can tell you definitively, she's not being terminated or fired. Uh, and she's still uh, the... Provost Marshal, I think that's what they call it. They gave me the title here. I, hmm? It's Provost Marshal. Provost Marshal General of the Army. Um, what's that? He is silent. It is. Okay. Thank you for thank you for that. No, actually, I, I appreciate that uh, because that's not a title I'm used to saying. But she's still in that job. Uh, she's not been terminated or fired. I don't have any announcements to make. And, again, for anything uh, beyond that, I'd, I'd point you to the Army. Thank you. But thanks for the opportunity to clear that up. Yeah, Mosh. Um, could you give us an update? Is there an update on the situation in Chad? Um, has the secretary spoken with his counterparts there? I'm sorry, about with who? With Chad. Is there a situational update? Um, or, sorry, an update on the situation in Chad? I, I don't have an update on Chad today, Mosh. But, you know, fair question. We'll take that, see if we can help get you something. But I can, all, but I can tell you, he, there, I have no conversations that the secretary has made uh, in recent days regarding Chad. Okay. Nancy. I have one question. The AT is reporting that um, the U.S. is looking to provide um, raw materials for the production of AstraZeneca to India. Is the DOD looking at providing supplies strictly related to oxygen-related oxygen related supplies, or is there anything that would be used for vaccine production? Uh, for what we're what we're looking at 
uh, mostly is, as I said, um, oxygen-related equipment, rapid testing kits, personal protective equipment, um, and other essential materials. Uh, uh, we're also going to be uh, coordinating with India directly about any other frontline uh, medical uh, needs that they might have. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, I don't believe that the raw materials issue is coming out of, in fact, I know it's not coming out of DOD. Um, uh, we aren't involved in the AstraZeneca vaccine. We're not using that. So those raw materials wouldn't be coming from us. But, Nancy, it's entirely uh, within the realm of the possible that we will be, as I said, helping with the transportation of those materials and as well as the materials uh, and equipment that we'll be providing from our own stocks. Uh, we fully anticipate uh, being involved in the logistics and the movement of it uh, over to India. Did that answer your question? I think so. I mean, if there's anything you see specific to that, yeah, I just want to get a sense of what's from DOD versus other government agencies yeah. that would have I don't, Right now, I don't see a role for us in, uh, in the AstraZeneca vaccine production part of it, because so we aren't to be clear. the raw materials, right? Because we're not, we're not using AstraZeneca uh, for our purposes. We use Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. But I fully would anticipate that we would be willing and able to assist in the transport uh, of those materials as needed. Okay. Uh, see, Jeff from Task and Purpose. Uh, thank you very much. When you were responding about the uh, Provost Marshall story, I didn't hear you say anything that indicated the Defense One story is wrong. She, this person is currently in her job. And she has no, and you have no personnel announcements to make today. Is that accurate? That's accurate, Jeff. So I'm just checking. You're not refuting the story, are you? I, I wasn't trying to refute anything, Jeff. I was answering a question by Mike, who asked me uh, whether she'd been fired. And I said she hadn't been. She was still in the job and that there were no personal announcements to speak to today. And again, this would really be for the Army to talk to, not, not me. Okay, one last question. An Army major was reportedly drugged and bitten by strippers in Poland. Will that affect the U.S. military's footprint in that country? story. <laughs> <laughs> it is a major story, and it happened in Gdansk. Jeff, I don't know anything about uh, that story. I'll I'll have a, a, a look at it. I'm not going to take that question. But oh, please take but that Jeff, question. Jeff, no, no, no. Jeff, just let me state clearly: we have a, a strong military relationship uh, with, with Poland, and uh, and we expect to see that continue to to grow and to improve. But I don't know I don't know anything about this particular item. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. I do have a uh, hard stop here at 4 o'clock, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to call it there. But thank you very much. Appreciate it. I could tell. No, I could tell he was serious about it. No, we have the story. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go take a look at it.